Hello, folks. I'm Noelle Cockett, president of Utah State University. And I'm very, very pleased to welcome you to today's webinar. I am uh, conducting this wel welcome in my capacity as chair of a commission called CFER, C-F-E-R-R, which is one of the seven commissions that APLU, the Associate Association of Public and Land Grant Universities have. Our mission of CEPR is to provide leadership on issues related to agriculture, food, human sciences, and natural resources. And so it's particularly appropriate for us to be holding this webinar that discusses climate change across North America. Clearly, this has grounds of, of issues in all of those different areas. We've been doing various webinars and other events through CFER on a variety of issues, ranging from mental health resources to regulation of genetic edited farm animals. And so again, very, very pleased to be with you today on climate change and the research that's being done at public and land grant institutions. I certainly am excited that we're doing this on Earth Day. Very, very appropriate to do. Um, on climate change, we uh, of course are seeing that as a major impact with agriculture. And we're proud of our researchers and scientists at our institution are helping the world uh, mitigate, mediate, and address and adapt climate change. Uh, one of the researchers at Utah State recently showed me some data where in the United States, over 75% of the people that were surveyed in a national uh, polling indicated that they accept that climate change is occurring and that 70% of the survey respondents believe that it's man caused. So we're definitely making uh, uh, actions and providing the kind of information that public needs to better understand what is happening with our world. Now, the interesting thing is that the public are becoming more uh, accepting that climate change is happening because of the more severe and more frequent weather patterns that are occurring. But the second way that they realize that climate change is occurring is through the information that they get in experts, uh, not the media, not what they read, not what they hear, but through actual researchers explaining uh, climate change, its causes, and how we might adapt to it. So it's particularly terrific to be able to talk today about the research that's been occurring in climate change across North America, as well as an awareness of what things still need to occur to help us to go forward with agriculture during this changing uh, world. Because we have to admit, as long as people inhabit the earth, they are going to need food. And I think it's through the work that we're doing at our public and land grants that will keep us going no matter how uh, climate change affects us. And we also can do uh, the kinds of research and outreach that is necessary to keep agriculture moving forward in sustainability in this very, very uh, different world that we're starting to experience. Um, so again, agriculture not only is providing food, but we have learned that it can contribute to the mediation of climate change through uh, storing carbon in soils, uh, reducing uh, food waste, optimizing crop production systems, 
and developing biotechnology to support plant and animal breeding programs. So again, agriculture will be on the front line of addressing concerns in sustainability and uh, while keeping our world fed. But we also see uh, the building of agriculture systems that will be more resilient, uh, dealing with things like drought, regenerative agriculture, climate adaption, and increasing biodiversity. So really excited to have all of you viewers, as well as the panelists, who will help us understand the areas of research that are going on in Canada, the United States, and Mexico, and then start to develop the kinds of partnerships and collaboration that we need to address this very, very important issue across North America. Now, uh, we had originally requested that the USDA Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack, would join us today. Unfortunately, from as you can imagine, his schedule is just full of uh, different requests of his time. So he wasn't able to attend today's webinar. However, he did prepare a short video outlining the climate change priorities for the Biden administration and the United States Department of Agriculture. <laughs> Please join me in celebrating the 51st anniversary of Earth Day, an annual observance to demonstrate support for environmental protection and contributions to a healthy, sustainable future. The Biden administration is committed to climate action, and we're raising our ambition. We can solve this crisis, but only if we work together. The coming decade will be decisive, especially for America's farmers, ranchers, and forest owners. Each of you has an important opportunity and role to play in combating the climate crisis and reducing greenhouse gas emissions by sequestering carbon in soil, grasses, trees, and other vegetation, and sourcing sustainable bioproducts in farmers and landowners to make climate smart practices work for you in a market-oriented way, a way that creates new streams of income, a cleaner energy future, bio-based manufacturing revolution. Under the Biden-Harris administration, USDA is engaged in a whole-of-government effort to combat the climate crisis, conserve and protect our nation's lands, biodiversity, and natural resources, including our soil, air, and water. Successfully meeting these challenges will require USDA and our agencies to pursue a coordinated approach alongside USDA partners, including state, local, and tribal governments. We all have a role to play safeguarding our planet for future generations. On this Earth Day, and for many more to come, USDA will be there to help you in this effort. Um, so we're really excited to have that video from USDA Secretary Tom Bielsack. Clearly, climate change is a priority for USDA. And, but I think what really came out of that is it isn't a single agency or a single country that is going to be addressing climate change uh, and its effect on the globe's people. And for that, again, we're excited to have this webinar to share what those different approaches are. And as I said before, hopefully identify areas that we can partner in and collaborate on. Uh, um, Excuse me. Our next part is to provide an introduction to our next speaker, and that's Peter McPherson. He is the president of APLU, or the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, which is here uh, in the North American uh, sector, an association of higher education that represents 245 uh, different institutions across public, land grant, state, and affiliate organizations. And uh, we have many missions within APLU, but it really centers along advancing college access and completion, 
and also strengthening that relationship between the university and the people we serve through engagement. Peter has served in a variety of positions in federal administration, including leading the United States Agency for International Development, which is the US foreign aid program, as deputy secretary of the US Department of Treasury, and immediately before coming to APLU in 2006, he served as president of Michigan State University. Um, clearly, Peter will be able to provide comments about APLU and also the North American Knowledge Zone. So really looking forward to hearing Peter address uh, is, us today on the webinar. Good to hear, good to be with all of you today. Uh, welcome to this Earth Day event. Uh, our discussions as we just indicated today will be about working together on these issues across Mexico, US and Canada. APLU's membership for several years now includes all the land grant universities in the country, most of the public, US, public research universities in the US, as well as leading public universities in Mexico and Canada. We call this membership, this tri-country membership, a zone of knowledge. There's so much benefit to universities in the region working together, most certainly in environment resilience, food, agriculture, health, and natural resources. There are no national borders for most of these issues. I'm sure we'll have an excellent discussion today. It's my pleasure to next introduce uh, Randy Woodson, who is the Chancellor of North Carolina State, longtime, very successful Chancellor. He's a former provost and president, at, pr provost and uh, Dean of Agriculture at Purdue University. He was chair of the board of APLU several years ago. Randy, it's good to see you and have you participate here today. Randy? Thank you, Peter. And it's uh, great to be with you and so many of my, I almost said old colleagues, but former colleagues in colleges of agriculture across uh, our three country region. Uh, also, Peter, I read in the New York Times today that uh, they dug up a, a jar that had been buried at Michigan State uh, filled with seeds to determine the, the longevity of seeds. And I immediately thought of you because I assumed you had buried the jar, but then I saw that it dated back over a hundred years. So I don't think even you would have been in a position uh, to put that time capsule in the earth in Lansing. Uh, but it's great to be with you all. Uh, today and uh, happy Earth Day. You know, those of us in production agriculture feel like every day is Earth Day because we have done so much as an industry over the years uh, to do everything in our power to make sure that we sustain this globe. Um, as I think about land grant universities and public universities across our three countries, uh, there's nothing, no one questions our role in inspiring youth through education in working with our constituents to make sure that we're doing everything possible uh, to keep food on the tables across our world, but also do, to do it in a way that's sustainable. Uh, and, and as I think about the grand challenge that we face now with climate change and, and resiliency associated with climate change, we're called upon to do even more and, and to be more creative and more collaborative and more interdisciplinary as we work across the many, many areas uh, that will be necessary to ensure that we can uh, sustain this globe and make sure that we address uh, the, the critical issue of climate change. One of the things that we're doing at NC State, and I know so many other universities are as well, is we're trying to hire faculty in different ways now faculty that come into the university with an intention to collaborate on some of the grand challenges that we face as society and to bring their disciplinary perspective to these issues. And as I look across the 20 or 25 um, 
clusters, faculty clusters that we've hired at NC State. Uh, we have a global environmental change and human health uh, cluster that is so uh, filled with agriculture colleagues and social scientists, as well as an environmental health and science cluster focused on some of the challenges that climate change has brought to the world of, of, of health. Um, one example that I want to use for you today, uh, we're in a coastal state uh, in North Carolina. Much of our coastline is, uh, is under uh, pressure because of climate change. This coastline also happens to be the home of some of the most productive and diverse agriculture in our country. And so all along the coast of North Carolina and the, the Piedmont associated with the coast, we're seeing the impacts of climate change. And one of the uh, approaches that we've taken here is to create a center for coastal resiliency that includes agricultural perspective, as well as uh, regional, uh, urban and rural design in, in help, trying to help so many of our communities that are struggling with the impacts of climate change, as well as addressing on, uh, on the front end, things that we can do uh, to, to address climate change from an agricultural perspective. Uh, you, uh, Noel mentioned carbon se sequestration. Uh, there's so much that we can do in production agriculture to make sure that we're thinking about the carbon economy in all the, the work that we do uh, as we grow the crops and the many uh, other uh, trees, et cetera, that we grow here in, in North Carolina and along the coast. Our university, along with so many others on the line today, have committed uh, to becoming climate neutral in a period of time. In our case, it's by 2050, although we're running well ahead of schedule in that. We, we all joined, many of us joined in the US, the American College and University President's Climate Commitment in 2008. And we haven't deterred from that mission in this, in this period of time since then. Educationally, many of us are also cre creating meaningful curricula around the issues of climate change. And that's true here at NC State as well, where we have master's programs focused on climate change as, and society, as well as certificates for people already in the workforce that are interested in learning more about and having a greater impact on uh, coastal resiliency and climate change resiliency. Uh, so working together on these issues and the workshops like this will help us all share best practices and be confident that our three countries can continue to collaborate in meaningful ways academically so that our universities are focused on doing everything we can uh, to combat the issue of climate change. Now, my only reason to be here really is to introduce our next speaker. And I'm super excited to do that because uh, Kathy Wateki is a dear friend and somebody that's been in our industry uh, for many, many years. She has a, she's been a lifelong leader within the land grant university system within US Department of Agriculture. She's known nationally and internationally for a wealth of knowledge of agriculture, food and nutrition and health uh, from her years, both in leadership in government, in the private sector and in academia where she served, uh, where Iowa State so well as their Dean. Uh, previous positions she's held include the Dean of the College of Agriculture at Iowa State, Under Secretary for USDA Research, Education and Economics, uh, and first Under Secretary of Agriculture for Food Safety during the Clinton administration, and Deputy Associate Director for Science in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Uh, she's currently uh, serving in the role as president of the Charles Valentine Riley Memorial Foundation, uh, which partners every year with AAAS for an important lecture and, and board member for the newly established North American Agriculture Advisory Network. Dr. Wateki is a recipient of so many awards that if I started now, we wouldn't have time for her speech or the panel, but she is a member of the USDA Hall of Fame. So please, Dr. Wateki, it's great to be with you and we look forward to your comments. 
Well, thank you so much, Chancellor Woodson. And also thanks to APLU for organizing this Earth Day webinar. I wanted to focus my comments this afternoon on the North American Agricultural Advisory Network. It's a new organization uh, that both Doug Steele and I have spent some time over this past year helping to get organized and, and operational. Uh, and uh, it's also wonderful that uh, Sol Ortiz is part of this program because in her role as advisor to uh, Secretary Villalobos in, uh, in Mexico, the Secretary of Agriculture, uh, she's also had an opportunity to, to help us in thinking through how to organize this new North American Agricultural Advisory Network. Next slide, please. Uh, the NON, as it's called, uh, is a new organization designed to link together the existing agricultural extension communities in Canada, Mexico, and the United States. It has a steering committee with high level representation from three countries, Mexico, uh, Secretary Villa Lobos is an, the ex officio member along with Carlos Vasquez Ochoa, Minister Counselor in the Mexican Embassy in Washington, and Lourdes Cruz uh, Trinidad, who's the General Coordinator and Secretary for the Secretariat of Agriculture and, and Rural Development in Mexico. For Canada, uh, Minister Bibal is the ex officio member. Dr. David Gray from Dalhousie University and Karen Churchill, who's the CEO of Ag West Bio are uh, two additional steering committee members. And for the US, Secretary Vilsack has been invited uh, in his return as secretary to the Department of Agriculture. Uh, and Doug, Doug Steele and myself are members of the advisory committee. So it's new for North America, but NAN will be part of the existing Global Forum for Rural Advisory Services. This Global Forum provides a forum and a voice for extension programs around the world. Next slide, please. The North American network is in an early stage of formation, but it will be a formal network with its secretariat housed at the Spur campus of Colorado State University. Next slide, please. This uh, NAN will be the North American platform linking extension systems in Canada, Mexico, and the United States, in which the members will share best practices and really learn from each other. It will re represent North America in the Global Forum uh, for Rural Advisory Services and we'll be working with our colleagues as equal partners moving forward together on jointly agreed projects. NON will be raising funds to support the work that it undertakes as well. Next, next slide, please. This North American network traces its beginnings to consultations with leadership in the US government and extension, including at the National Institute of Food and Agriculture at USDA, the US Agency for International Development, ECOP and APLU, as well as key stakeholders uh, in similar organizations in Mexico and Canada. And the uh, result of, of these consultations uh, was a decision uh, made in 2019 to form a North American network. Next slide, please. As the discussions progressed, um, there were a number of key agreements that were made that are, that are outlined here. Uh, one is that NON would be a network uh, and it would build on the existing strengths and networks in the three countries in North America. Another agreement was that NON would be a forum for discussing problems and solutions uh, uh, that are common uh, to the three countries. Uh, it would build and expand the relationships focusing on shared learning uh, and shared programming, uh, expand opportunities for practitioners as well as stakeholders around a common North American agenda and experience. And lastly, it 
would, was recognized that we would all benefit from this networking given the changing environment for food production and global food security. Next slide, please. Another early agreement is that any work programs that are undertaken will have three components as shown here. Uh, first, knowledge development and management. Uh, secondly, networking. Again, that learning from each other. And thirdly, policy advocacy. And the topics of the first three work programs are agreed uh, and are in development. One of those is around biodefense and biosecurity as it, they, those topics relate to both crops and livestock. Uh, a second topic is youth and career development. And the third topic, it, very appropriate to the theme of today's program is climate change. Next slide, please. Climate change was selected because it's one of the biggest challenges facing food security in North America, because all three countries have research and extension programming related to climate change, adaptation and mitigation in agricultural systems. And because we share common agroecological systems. Advisory services have an important role in helping farmers manage soils, water, crops, and livestock, and to prepare for and respond to climate shocks. The first project that is being undertaken by this new network in this program is to inventory uh, all of the current work in the North American advisory services related to climate change as in, in agriculture. So that inventory in and of itself is going to have a huge value as a starting point for networking. Next slide, please. So if you'd like more information about NON, uh, or if you'd like to get involved, uh, please send an email uh, to the address that's shown on the left-hand side there, noninfo at coloradostate.edu. We're just getting started. Your participation could really make a difference and we would really welcome whatever ideas you could bring. So thank you so much for the opportunity to participate in today's program. We've got no time to lose in combating climate change and we've got much to learn from our neighbors in Canada and Mexico. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wateki. We appreciate your comments and in introducing. Uh, the uh, newly developed uh, non-program to our uh, participants in the webinar. And I, I think what you just shared uh, mirrors very closely with what uh, President McPherson was saying about uh, the North American Knowledge Zone. It wasn't that many years ago during the, the uh, USDA Ag Outlook Forum, we had the ministers of agriculture from Canada and Mexico, along with our Secretary of Agriculture, sharing the same stage and talking about the need to think about the North American region and not three individual countries. And I, I think what I see happening, and part of it's because of the pandemic, we are softening those uh, uh, national borders and, and uh, looking how to work together more. And I think the North American Agricultural Advisory Network is uh, one of the uh, organizations that can help make this possible. And if I reflect back on, on Chancellor uh, Woodson's comment, a lot of the basic research on climate change, climate resiliency has already been conducted. The challenge that we see many times in our country is how to get that technology adopted because sometimes in agriculture, we may be a little bit slow to change. We may be a little bit slow to look at new practices or adoption of new technologies. And the more we work together, I think the stronger system we'll have coming forward. And as uh, President Cockett said in her opening remarks, uh, we live in a day and a time where we can't find these solutions alone. We can't operate in a, in a vacuum. We can't continue to build silos between our countries. We've got to work together because it can take us all working together to solve the problems that we're facing, not just today, but the emerging problems we see identified every day. Well, my name is Doug Steele and I'm Vice President uh, for Food, Ag and Natural Resources at the Association of Public and Land-Grant Universities. And it has been one of the greatest joys of my my career professionally and my personal life to be able to have worked with each of these uh, speakers in the past 
Uh, they are leaders in our field. They are leaders within our university system. And we're just so grateful for what they've done and continue to do uh, to support the work that we do through agriculture. And I, I think back to when uh, our land-grant universities in the United States were established was the same year that the United States Department of Agriculture was established. And I know that when Abraham Lincoln signed the USDA into law, he said the intent for the United States Department of Agriculture is to be the people's department. This will be the department that, that works with and assists and helps our country be stronger because we can feed our people. And obviously, as land-grant universities developed in the United States over the years with a teaching mission, a research mission, and an extension outreach engagement mission, uh, we have seen the results of those decisions made over 150 years ago uh, continue to allow our country to prosper and our citizens to benefit. Yes, we have trying times now, but uh, the one thing I like to remind myself is agriculture is probably one of the most bipartisan sectors that we could work in today. And uh, we hope to be able to use uh, our, our partnerships uh, within our countries, uh, the outstanding ag producers we get to work with, and the communities that we serve to continue to make a difference in what we do. It's my pleasure now to introduce our panel to you. And uh, uh, we really thought very uh, deliberately about who could represent our three countries and bring a message to this group that uh, would really uh, highlight, uh, I guess, three major focus areas. One is please provide a perspective of your, your country and how you see climate change uh, currently impacting your country. Uh, provide some examples of research that's currently ongoing as you're aware of and that uh, how we start to see connections of uh, research and extension programs to address this climate change. And then finally, I've asked our speakers and panelists to look into a crystal ball and what do they see coming? Uh, we can already see indications that uh, there's other uh, topics of climate uh, that we need to be aware of. And I just asked the speakers to finish, spend a couple of minutes and maybe share their perspective on where we think this is gonna lead us. And so to help with the transition time, you will see all three speakers and their titles are currently listed on this slide. In between each speaker, you will see this slide pop back up to give us a chance to, to transition. And so I'm gonna take the opportunity to at, introduce each speaker just as they get ready to uh, present. And so we'll have three, two short breaks uh, during the presentations uh, and transition to the next speaker. I would also like to remind you that we will take questions and answers. I see many of you are already using the, the Q&A box. Please continue to do so. If you have questions specifically for our panelists, to put those in the box. And at the conclusion of the three presentations, we will have adequate time to come back and have that discussion. And if you have general comments, to the speaker's points, please put them in the chat in the question and answer box to share with others that are also participating in the webinar. Well, first up, we get to turn to one of our, our, our great partners uh, uh, from the Northern border, McGill University. Uh, I have had the opportunity to uh, get to know uh, Dr. Anna Gitman about the last three years now during our work with the Canadian Council on Deans. And it's just a thrill to have her here to re represent our Canadian partners and our Canadian universities that are part of APLU. Dr. Getman is the Dean and of the Faculty of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences and Associate Vice Principal at McGill University. She joined McGill in 2015, following 14 years of experience as a professor in the Department of Microsciences at the University of Montreal and the Institute of Biological, whatever those French words say. <laughs> I apologize for that, Dr. Getman. <laughs> I should have converted the language, huh? But I do know this, she's a renowned plant biologist. Uh, she does hold the Canadian Research Chair Tier 1 in biomechanics of plant development. And her research is focuses on the cellular process that underlies the development and reproduction of plants. Obviously a very critical area when we talk about climate and addressing climate change. Uh, her current administrative duties as Dean mandates that she oversees, oversees McGill University's research activities and a teaching mandate in plant and animal sciences, food sciences and human nutrition, parasitology and environmental sciences and bio research engineering. We are so pleased to have Dr. Gitman today and we welcome her to the podium for her presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Steele, for this elaborate uh, introduction. I'm truly pleased to be here at this pan North American um, uh, 
uh, event and, and forum, since I think it is so important that all of us speak together. Now, I don't only speak for McGill University, of course. Uh, I speak for all the Canadian deans in agriculture. And if we go to the next slide, we see where all these faculties are. Um, so you can see across uh, from coast to coast to coast, we have eight faculties of agriculture, university faculties of agriculture, and together, if we get the next click, we see that joint uh, with five faculties of veterinary medicine, we form the Dean's Council of Agricultural Faculty, or Faculties of Agriculture and Veterinary Medicine. And so we interact very regularly with the APLU, and this uh, connection is really, really important for us. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, let's focus on uh, climate change in particular. Of course, being a country that is at higher latitude than our neighbors, um, there are a lot of common challenges and opportunities, but some uh, opportunities and challenges are singular to, to Canada. And I thought in order to give this a, a particular Canadian flavor, uh, I, I highlight these. I'm going to start out with the, um, with the positive side, so to say, the opportunities. The predictions are, of course, for um, agriculture uh, that, that uh, the entire regions, all the regions will experience and have experienced over the last 60 years an increase in temperature. Now, since we have long winters, that simply translates into shorter winters or shorter periods uh, with frost. And uh, this applies in particular to the northern regions that are highlighted in red here, as well as to the prairie regions. And if we click again, we see what kind of uh, opportunities arise from these kinds of temperature changes. This would allow us uh, to expand the growing season, uh, which of course might allow to actually grow different kinds of crops. In terms of livestock production, uh, we can think of um, lowering feed requirements, uh, increasing survival rates of, of young animals, and or reducing the cost for heating, of course, whether uh, that will be compensated with the cost for increased cooling in summer is of course another question. Also, we might be able um, to uh, improve our, the ability of soil to actually capture carbon. And uh, there might be a, pot a potential for the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions uh, in changing land use from annual crops to perennial crops, for example. There is a challenge also, or there is an opportunity that frankly links to a challenge. The opportunity is uh, the increase, the potential increase of the surface of arable land because uh, of the warming in particular in the north. But that uh, comes with an in, uh, immediate challenge since uh, we might want to consider whether we really want to convert uh, land in northern areas to uh, agriculture since much of that is peatland, for example, or marshland that actually already captures enormous amounts of carbon and converting it to agriculture could only uh, lead to release of those greenhouse gases. Now, if we go to the next slide, we see the actual challenges and many of those are of course shared with our neighbors to the south. Uh, springs are expected to be more humid, whereas summers are expected to be drier than before. We see that uh, when you look at the maps here, you see the predictions uh, or what has actually happened over, over recent years uh, in spring and in summer, uh, in particular in, in Alberta. And you see that there has been a change in, in these two directions, which is, of course, important because the average doesn't matter so much. Uh, if you have a more humid spring, that uh, affects the planting season. And if you have a drier summer, that's the maturation of the crop in the harvest, and that could be very critical for overall uh, harvest results. Um, the other challenge is, of course, common with our neighbors to the south, and that is the increase in intensity and frequency of droughts. If we click again, we see a, a, a sketch or a graph that everybody has seen multiple times with a slight increase in average temperature and a slight increase in the, in the distribution of dramatic events, be it droughts, being floods. We get an actually substantial increase of the single number of, of events that might happen, and so that will significantly affect how we do agriculture. Culture. If we click again concretely, we, seen, uh, we see what kind of uh, effects this might have. So just to summarize, we might have more droughts, we might ha also have more, more floods, and that might limit uh, the availability of pasture, and that creates heat, wave heat waves. And that is critical for livestock production, as we all know. Uh, it might both uh, affect uh, survival of animals, but also simple weight gain. Um, it might affect uh, the growth of weeds. Uh, it might affect, and it will, and it already does affect the arrival of pests and pathogens. 
uh, that come, of course, across the border without having to have a passport in order to do so, unfortunately. And so um, the disease availability will not only affect what is currently arable land, but also will affect Arctic wildlife, which of course uh, links to the whole food security issue that uh, affects indigenous populations. So numerous challenges that prevail. Added to this on the next slide, we will see that we already have problems that uh, relate to soil. And one is very, very dramatic. That's the decline in soil organic matter, particularly in Eastern Canada. Here in the graph, what is red is the decline over the last few decades. And on the next sl slide, we see that this is uh, paired actually with an increase in residual soil nitrogen after harvest, again, in Eastern Canada in particular. So clearly the soil quality in Eastern Canada in particular is in decline for several reasons, and that is incredibly uh, critical, which of course leads me to the research activities that take place on our side of the border. And on this slide, you see that um, soil is a fundamental issue that is being uh, addressed in particular by researchers in Eastern Canada. I just provide a couple of examples here. Uh, so there's research going on uh, with regards to the effect of microbial communities uh, on soil quality and on the ability of soil to actually keep soil organic matter. And there, there is research into uh, the tracking of the influence of all kinds of management factors uh, on soil carbon as well as greenhouse gas emissions. And the photo that I'm showing is just one uh, uh, image that illustrates the research done by our professor Cynthia Kallenbach in the Department of Natural Resource Sciences and our own faculty. On the next slide, uh, uh, we will uh, see, uh, if I can, yes, thank you. Uh, we will see research in, into one of the other stresses. Uh, so abiotic stress. Under abiotic stress, of course, we understand everything that has to do with temperature and humidity. And as mentioned, we'll have to deal with both heat and drought on one side and excess humidity on the other side. And so um, uh, a lot of research is being dedicated to breeding cultivars that are able to cope with these. Uh, as well as, as, as research that addresses uh, management uh, practices. On the next slide, uh, we also see the particular challenges that arise through the biotic risks. And that is through the increase of, of temperature, uh, we will have an arrival and we already see that of, of uh, pests that we didn't, I don't wanna say didn't know before, but we weren't exposed to before. And so these can be insect pests, there could be diseases, invasive plants as well, nematodes, fungal diseases, et cetera, et cetera. And so interestingly, we will not only um, figure out, have to figure out how our all agricultural practices will have to address these pests directly, but there is a compounding effect potentially by the increased level of carbon dioxide. So the increased level of carbon dioxide might actually affect the plant's innate capacity to um, uh, uh, display resistance against these pests. So it's a double whammy, really. It's temperature, new pests, but also uh, a lowered resistance. And so there's research going on at UBC Vancouver into, into these challenges in particular. Uh, if we go to the next slide, um, uh, the, there has been a wide recognition of these uh, challenges. And so luckily the uh, Canadian government, uh, notably through their agency, the Canadian Food and Agriculture Agency, Food Inspection Agency have um, uh, put a lot of emphasis in creating a new task force in order to uh, not only um, uh, celebrate, so to say, the year of plant health, which uh, was last year, but also take initiatives in order to see what needs to be done in order to address these uh, challenges. On the next slide, I just summarize a couple of the questions um, that I think will be really relevant, not only for Canada, but actually for all North America uh, for the coming years in order to address both in form of research activities, but also outreach activities and communication to producers. One is um, how do we efficiently monitor actually the, the status of the soil, right? We always talk about carbon capture and how important it is to, uh, uh, to do regenerative agriculture, make sure that uh, carbon stays in the soil. But um, unless we actually follow and measure what happens, this is difficult to do. And if you think back of one of the first slides I show, you will have seen that the data that I showed were two 
2011 data. That was the most recent data I was able to find. So that's already 10 years old. So it seems to be a real challenge to actually monitor everything. The second one is the issue I just mentioned is that of biosecurity and that for that clearly we need that international collaboration because all the pests that we will get in Canada we didn't have before will of course come from south of the border and so we will have to learn to see how to manage these. The challenge for us will be that the predators, the natural predators, don't necessarily come in the same way and so we might have to manage these differently. Um, in general, all of us need to work together to make sure that the agri-food sector in general increases in resilience, a crucial element, of course, for the production. And we have to ask ourselves, how can we strengthen efforts in order to um, um, make sure that agriculture can be leveraged to reduce global uh, greenhouse gas emissions and to increase carbon capture? We are one of the biggest sectors that has the cap capacity to do so. Of course, we have to do all of this while feeding a growing population, a challenge that is not about um, a challenge overall for the um, international community. And finally, we must not forget One Health. The notion of One Health is not widespread yet beyond uh, the scientific community, but that connection between human health, uh, animal health, animal production and the way we do agriculture and the way we produce our food has actually been made very obvious during this pandemic, right? Um, the virus came probably somewhere from animals that were somewhere in the human food chain. And so this chain of food and the connectivity between human health and animal health has to be much, we have to be much more aware of this and policymakers have to be made much more aware of this. And if we click one more, once more, I just wanted to highlight and get exactly that we need international collaboration to address all these challenges, um, to address the common threats and to find the solutions, of course. And so uh, I thank you once more uh, for the invitation to, to join this panel. I think it is, a truly, truly important sign that we give, um, a, we, we create this opportunity to talk across borders uh, to ensure that we address these challenges together. Thank you, Dr. Gitman. We, we appreciate your perspective and your comments and uh, look forward when we get to the question and answer time uh, to some specific questions that may come your way. Uh, we'll move on now to our, our next presenter uh, that uh, is uh, representing uh, the institutions of uh, Mexico. Uh, Dr. Saul Ortiz uh, Garcia has a bachelor's degree, is a biologist from the Faculty of Sciences and the National Autonomous University of Mexico and a doctorate in ecology from the Institute of Ecology at UNAM. She's also done postdoc work at Karoo Bi Biotonical Gardens. She's taught courses on the Faculty of Sciences since 1992 on a wide variety of activities and subject matters, including ecology, systematics, and biosafety. She works in the public sector, sector since 2001, first at the National Institute of Ecology as an advisor to the president, and later as the coordinator of the biosafety program. From 2007 to 2008, she joined the National Council of Science and Technology in the Executive Secretariat's office working on issues related to the safe use of biotechnology. Saul has collaborated with the United Nations Environmental Programs and with the Organization for Food and Agriculture in training workshops, capacity building activities. She has published scientific papers, book chapters, and several popular articles in national and international journals, which, journals, and she's contributed to three different books. Since December of 2018, Saul has served as director General Director for the Attention of Climate Change in the Agricultural Sector within the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development. We were first introduced to Dr. Garcia because of her work with the North America Agricultural Advisory Network and connections we're making uh, with Mexico and the Department of Agriculture. We're very thrilled to have you here, Dr. Garcia, and uh, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much for your kind words of introduction. I will like to start by um, 
thanking all, all the organizers for organizers for the invitation, the Association for Public and Land Grant Universities, particularly the Office of Food, Agriculture and Natural Resources, the North American Agricultural Advisory Network, thank you very much as well, and the Up to North American Knowledge Zone for their really uh, all their support to participate in this event. In my presentation, I will address the questions that um, you propose us. Uh, what are the current impacts of climate change? What are we doing with a very few examples and related um, mo mostly with our planification instruments and commitment that we have uh, under the sustainable development goals, as well as with a recently published national determined contribution, our NDC, this under the Paris Agreement. And finally, I will briefly mention what are the climate uh, issues for tomorrow that need to be addressed today. And all of this will be from the perspective of the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development, where I currently work. So uh, first slide, please. In relation to the current impacts of climate change, you see here a comparison from the Mexican drought monitor uh, of this year to your left and from last year at the right and, uh, and at the same date, April 15, showing that uh, for this year around 70% of our territory is affected uh, by some degree of drought from severe to exceptional drought in some northern regions of our country. And I suspect that this is shared for uh, southern parts of the US. And this I consider some of the more worrisome effects of the increase in temperature related to climate change. You can also notice that uh, the effect this far on the peninsula of Yucatan is not as bad. That's the gray part you can see there. And this is mainly related to the fact that last year there were several floods in this region. Next slide, please. So um, here, what we see is that even though drought is one of our main concerns in our country, since 70% of our territory is uh, mainly dry, there are also effects on agriculture and livestock from other extreme hydrometeorological events. And these conditions and are often uh, related or exacerbated by soil degradation and soil er erosion. Um, the next slide, please. Uh, one of the reasons why agriculture in Mexico is so vulnerable to climate change is related to the fact that the availability of water in Mexico in relation to the whole uh, North American region is around 8%. So our rain-fed agriculture, the one that we depend uh, the one that depends on precipitation and the one that we uh, depend the most occupies 70% of our agricultural land. And this um, type of agriculture, the rain fed agriculture, is mainly related with uh, smaller farmers. And uh, this, uh, if you can put the next slide, please. This condition is also reflected on particularly challenging scenarios, in this case for maize, our main domestic crop, uh, illustrated uh, in, in the changes of yield in maize, uh, forecast for the 2050 um, year. And this under the RCP of 8.5 model in a study from the International Maize and Wheat Center. And this is comparing also irrigated and rain-fed production. What you see here in the green color illustrates the yield increases while yellow, orange, and red colors illustrate yield reduction. And I want you to notice that the scale in irrigated maize and production zones in rain-fed zones are different and also that most changes show a loss in yields and this is significantly higher for obvious reasons in the rainfed region, regions. So this is a very challenging situation and this uh, illustrates, uh, I think, some of the most uh, and currently um, threats that we uh, are facing. Next slide, please. In, in this slide, I want to share with you the main planning tool, our war, our program on agriculture and rural development, and, and its main three pillars are uh, that contribute to food security. These are productivity, inclusion, and sustainability. And I want also to, to, to show how this um, program is related in different ways to uh, the sustainable 
uh, development goals. You can see most of them there. Um, the, the ones closer to the circle are the ones that are more related with what we are doing right now, but obviously uh, it will have effects what we do with uh, several of the development, uh, sustainable development goals. And also I want to go through, uh, if you can, can do a click please, I want to show how this, um, is related as well with our national determined contribution, the arts, NDC. And I will do this with the three uh, very brief examples. If you can uh, put, please, the next slide. Um, here uh, we, we have, uh, um, in relation to generate uh, agroclimatic information to have early warning systems and tools that would benefit small farmers, we are working with what we call the technical agroclimatic roundtables. This initiative seeks to generate scenarios for analysis among farmers, government officials, and academics. We work together, we, we gather, well, uh, this last one was uh, obviously virtually, but we gather together and we uh, analyze the forecast for the next three months in the particular region. And in a very collective and participatory exercise, um, we come up with a result that is called the uh, uh, agroclimatic bulletin, which uh, gives some recommendations for um, how the, um, the farmers could uh, work with the forecast uh, climate and which uh, could be the crops that they could plant in which will be the best uh, moment to to do so. So this illustrates the case for the um, state of Chiapas and we want to um, uh, es escalate these efforts, mainly focusing on small farmers. Next slide, please. Here, I, I choose this example that you see here because illustrate the interrelation among climate change, biodiversity and food security, as well as the importance of intersectoral and interinstitutional work. We recently finished our national strategy for the conservation and sustainable use of pollinators, we call it NCUSP, which took was almost two years um, to conclude, but uh, it took that long because we have a very participatory process, although uh, we couldn't meet as many times as we wanted because the first workshops were presential, but the last ones were also virtually. But um, we include, uh, besides several um, government agencies, we have a very important participation from academy and researchers, as well as farmers, producers and NGOs, uh, and also representatives from indigenous communities. So we have this uh, NCUS, this strategy, we are starting with the implementation stage, which is also very challenging. But um, we want to get involved with uh, other regions and as well with uh, state uh, governments and local governments to be able to uh, implement this uh, strategy. And we are also wanting to involve with uh, citizens that uh, are um, getting the awareness of the importance of this uh, ecosystem service, not just for uh, food, but also for contributing to maintaining biodiversity. The last example I want to share with you is in relation to promote the conservation of genetic resources. You can see it in the next slide, please. And it's um, particularly working with uh, four different groups of organisms and genetic resources. In the case of plants, we are focusing on the native crops. As you know, we are centers of origin of very many important uh, crops, including maize. And here in, in, with this work, what we are strengthening is the interrelation between networks of academics and and relevant stakeholders to come up with a working plan for conserving our genetic resources and um, make a good use for them on in terms of the adaptation for climate change. Uh, 
Now, in the last slide that I want to share with you today, I will briefly touch on the topics of tomorrow that need to be addressed now or yesterday. And as I was mentioning, crop adaptation, I think our colleague from Canada also mentioned that, is a very important issue to uh, being able to uh, grow in new conditions and how can we select uh, varieties that will fulfill the expectations of uh, all farmers. Also, uh, soil recarbonization is very important and we are working on how to estimate and measure the contribution of agriculture to carbon capture and to reduc the reduction of uh, greenhouse houses. Um, greenhouse gases <laughs> emissions. Also, um, we are wanting to generate uh, benefits for farmers that are using sustainable management soil practices as uh, compensation mechanisms to uh, foster this kind of practices and get them benefits for, for those farmers that are following up and contributing to, to uh, carbon capture. Uh, another important issue for us is how to um, recognize which are the best sustainable agricultural practices in different regions or for different crops in different agroecosystems. And this beyond uh, the, the um, just measuring productivity, but also measuring other issues, for example, uh, conserving uh, biodiversity, generating uh, markets for farmers, etc. Uh, finally, uh, there are also already important research on improving livestock feeding, in this for the reducing methane emissions, but is still on the um, uh, research phase. We want to start in applying this um, knowledge, and we are exploring this particularly feeding uh, livestock with uh, native uh, species, which will also contribute to fostering uh, silvip silvopastoral practices. Finally, just to put another very uh, important example, uh, fish and water use in agriculture for different crops, different production systems is one also of our main focus and we would like to contribute, uh, collaborate and work with you on this. So this is it for now. Thank you very much and uh, for your attention. Next slide is just to thank you for hearing me. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Ortiz Garcia. Uh, I, I found it interesting. Your last slide, you you mentioned that here's topics that we started working, we should have started working on yesterday, and now they're on the horizon of tomorrow. And as I listened to your presentation, I kept uh, bringing to mind the fact that the, these issues that we see don't really know any kind of uh, national or international boundaries. It's something that we need to really uh, look at together and uh, hopefully continue. Uh, the work that uh, we've outlined that our, our countries are doing now in a more collaborative nature. Uh, you, you had a great order, overview and some very challenging uh, ideas for us to consider. So thank you for that. Thank you. We'll now move to the third uh, member of our panel representing the United States of America. And it has been my, my pleasure to know uh, Dr. Moses Cairo for several, several years now, but uh, in the last couple of years working very closely with him as he was first the chair of LEC and now the chair of the Experiment Station Committee on Organization and Policy. Uh, and Moses became chair at a time when we have a lot of things going on, uh, a lot because of the pandemic, a lot because of uh, our uh, need to increase spending on ag research infrastructure, and obviously because of the climate change issues that the United States is facing today. Uh, Moses was appointed professor and dean of the School of Agriculture and Natural Sciences at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore in August of 2012. As Dean, he's responsible for administrating academic programs in the school and the land grant missions of research and extension. Prior to joining Maryland Eastern Shore, Moses spent nearly seven years at Florida A&M University as a professor of entomology and director of the Center for Excellence in Biological Control, which is a cooperative initiative between uh, Florida A&M, USDA Ag Research Service, and the USDA Animal Health Plan Inspection Services. Uh, between 2008 and 2012, Moses also served as Associate Research Director for 1890 programs. We are so thrilled to have Moses here. His research interests have been focused on biological control and basis species management and crop production 
all three areas that are in one way or the other also facing the impacts of, of climate change. Over the years, he has carried out work in many countries, including Africa, Europe, the Middle East, Latin America, and the Caribbean. And over the years, Dr. Cairo has undertaken consultancy work with several international organizations as they help them address issues of food and food production. We're so thankful, uh, Dr. Cairo, to have you here. And it's my pleasure to turn the panel uh, floor over to you now. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Steele. Uh, and I'm uh, very excited to be here uh, with you this afternoon. Um, as you all know, 2020 set a new annual uh, record with 22 separate billion dollar weather events. Uh, there were seven uh, uh, out of the 22 were hurricanes and the previous record was 16 in 2011 and 2017. 2020 was also the sixth consecutive year with 10 or more billion dollar events. Uh, I believe you do not need to be a scientist to know that climate change is serious. It's here and requires uh, our urgent action. Next slide, please. So uh, as we had uh, in the presentation from Secretary Vilsack, the Biden administration has characterized climate change as an existential threat. Indeed, uh, six days into his inauguration, President Biden issued an executive order uh, entitled Tackling Climate Crisis at Home and Abroad. Uh, during the telecast of the signing, the president noted that we had to supercharge our climate change uh, response. Uh, this is particularly important uh, for a challenge that has such broad dimensions in national security, foreign policy, agriculture, energy. You only need to look at uh, winter storm URI in Texas and its impact, transportation and economy. In considering the subject for the webinar this afternoon, I was also cognizant of the fact that the experiments uh, station section regional executive directors recently completed a survey uh, to essentially assess the climate research capacities of the experiment station section. The information they collected speaks, uh, I think, uh, to some level uh, directly to the focus of today's seminar. And over the next few slides, I'd like to cover some of the salient points uh, coming from this survey. So the survey itself uh, included an assessment uh, uh, of 77 land grant institutions across the nation. And we had uh, 62 of them responding. That was 80% uh, response rate, which is, I think, quite remarkable. So what are some of the results? So in response uh, to one of the questions, which was whether uh, uh, the experiment station was engaged in any kind of climate research, the overwhelming response uh, from 93% uh, of the respondents was yes. Uh, but the survey also drilled deeper and respondents were provided with 14 different domains of climate research um, that were initially actually suggested by Cornell's Institute for Climate Smart Solutions. And they were asked to indicate uh, those in which they were active. As you can see from this slide, 90% um, indicated they were active in the sustainable ag, food security, food safety space. 77% in natural resources, biodiversity and water resources. 60% uh, in areas to do with carbon emissions, carbon sequestration and carbon banking, 55% uh, in efficiency of nutrient use, managed livestock or agronomic systems, and 55% in climate change sciences and modeling. And I think some of my colleagues have been speaking to some of these areas. In summary, the uh, experiment station section has the capacity to conduct climate research, which is spread right across the country and with a very broad disciplinary focus uh, for innovation, covering aspects along the continuum from production, 
to mitigation to adaptation. What is, all, what is not explicit in this data though is, uh, uh, but is probably true, is the fact that the research capacity would also be mirrored in the extension and workforce development space. Next slide, please. Uh, of course, resources are a critical, uh, and even as we contemplate how we can expand the work in this area, it is pertinent to know how current work is supported. So 86% of the institutions reported having uh, received competitive grant funding uh, to support climate research. And among some of the key agencies were USDA, the National Science Foundation, Department of Energy, and uh, no, 77% uh, indicated investing capacity funds. Uh, uh, that is Hatch uh, for 1862s and Evans Allen for 1890s uh, in climate research. Interesting, critically, 87% of the directors also noted uh, an interest in participating in a nationwide effort to address climate change and nobody said uh, no. And that was quite remarkable, just that interest and willingness to collaborate across the country. I think we can safely extrapolate from this and say that uh, these scientists would be more than willing to work with our partners in Mexico and Canada. And I think this is particularly pertinent as many institutions uh, reported unique research capacities, including human capital, uh, with international or who, those who are non-nationally uh, and capable uh, of bringing this kind of uh, uh, well-rounded, uh, well-established faculty uh, to address this critical issue. Next slide, please. So the survey also looked at gaps and opportunities, which will be particularly important as we start considering actions for the immediate and medium, medium term. So as regards gaps, the survey did re reveal a few. Uh, for instance, only 16% of the institutions reported having human capacity on issues of equity and climate impact on communities of color. And only 18% reported having capacity uh, on social change and impacts. Additionally, only 29% uh, of the uh, institutions reported having capacity on human health and urban environments. Social science uh, and policy domains of climate research were also identified as areas which uh, would benefit from growth and investment. So with this said, uh, there is an opportunity for institutions to seek experts outside our traditional areas of expertise within the, within the section. And in fact, given today's so the, the conversations this afternoon, uh, reaching out to our neighbors uh, in Canada and Mexico. Next slide, please. So the success of, um, the success of uh, uh, future thrusts uh, in climate research will critically depend on availability of both uh, physical and financial resources. Indeed, uh, investment is needed to drive innovation. Uh, I have just mentioned human capital as an area of investment. Uh, while not surprising, less than half the institutions reported having labs uh, uniquely con that having labs that were uniquely configured to address climate change, and only 33 percent indicated having state-of-the-art instrumentation uh, for climate re research. So what came through loud and clear was that facilities and instrumentation are areas ripe for investment, as are the opportunities to grow both competitive uh, and capacity funding to support climate research. An important area of attention uh, will be uh, breaking down barriers by promoting 
interagency uh, agreements that foster collaboration, cooperation, and innovation to address this critical issue. And this is, again, as a backdrop that looking at some of the uh, federal agencies, there were more than uh, 12 federal agencies engaged uh, and the identifying ways in which we can engage them even more effectively would, would be extremely beneficial. Next slide, please. So what, what does this all mean? Uh, in, uh, in a nutshell, the experiment station, uh, station section has the capacity to address this existential issue. And given the impact of climate change is place-based, uh, I believe the widely dispersed nature of our uh, nationwide system of stations and the expertise provide portals for addressing both local and regional and national issues. And there is a tremendous scope uh, for cross-border linkages to address common problems that uh, cut across uh, the three countries. I think without a doubt uh, to address uh, such complex uh, problems as, as those posed by climate change, uh, we really must think out of the box uh, in all the spaces that require action. And uh, my colleagues on the panel have uh, been speaking to, to some of these, these areas. It will also be important to invest in the development of human and fiscal capital to facilitate innovation in this important area. I think the current efforts that are focused on seeking support for building the agricultural research infra infrastructure is vitally important. And we will need to invest uh, efforts in building collaborative uh, uh, activities between institutions, uh, also across uh, disciplinary areas in order for us to fill some of those gaps that, that exist. So with that said, uh, I just would like to um, take this opportunity. You can move to the next slide, but uh, essentially to thank uh, the, the, our team of executive directors from across the, the five regions uh, of the experiment station section uh, for collating uh, some of the information that I've shared with you this afternoon. So with that, Doug, thank you. Uh, I want to thank you, Dr. Cairo. I want to thank uh, all of our panelists for your presentations of your insights you've shared with us. Uh, I'm going to uh, ask a, a couple of our uh, uh, earlier speakers, from the, well, an earlier speaker today and our closing speaker to start with the first question. So uh, President Cockett, do you want to ask the first question of the panelists, please? Certainly. Uh... So we've received some great questions from uh, both in the chat and the QA. Um, and uh, one of those is about uh, advising faculty and scientists uh, when they're addressing concerns of climate change, uh, but when they're meeting resistance about climate change. So those, and, and I will say that in my state of Utah, that is one of the issues for my researchers and my extension people uh, when they go out to help producers or speaking, uh, that climate change is not actually happening. So what, what could uh, these different researchers or faculty or even students use in addressing that pushback? I'll be pleased to start with that. Um, I would love to be able to say in Canada, that's not a problem. However, it actually is. There are people who still um, don't think it will uh, affect them. And if there is an effect, uh, the positive effects will, uh, will be dominant. And so uh, science communication is, is incredibly important. We have realized that during the pandemic, right? We need to actually hear from the scientists themselves. And often they are not trained to talk to a general public. So what we take very seriously at our university is training scientists, our young 
young researchers to actually talk to the general public to learn that um, you have to talk to the general public in very different ways than you talk to your um, scientists, colleagues and peers. And so communication strategies are incredibly important. They are as important as the actual information that needs to be conveyed. Um, convincing somebody of, of, of something they, they completely don't believe in is, is, is really hard, and, and, but our, our best tool, I think, are facts, right? And so uh, we have to bring facts, but we have to know how to communicate these. And so one of the training opportunities really for our young scientists is exactly that, how to communicate these. Thank you. Does another, another panelist want to respond? Well, I, I would just like to add, uh, and on top of, of, of the fact that communication is a challenge, is a fact that uh, we now also have a lot of information that is uh, erroneous or not fact-based fact that uh, is available to people. And we have to counteract um, the impact of some of uh, that information that's out there on the internet. So I, I just agree with Anja. Uh, completely that we have to really focus on, on, on science communication and being able uh, to get that message out, uh, not just to uh, the adult public, but all the way down to uh, our schools. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Kuhn, you want to go to the next question, please? Yes, thank you, Dr. Steele. Uh, and thanks to the panelists. Uh, very interesting examples that you had. I think one of the challenges we have is that we can't do just one thing. And so while we're responding to these challenges uh, with regards to, to climate change, we're also facing social challenges and recognizing the uh, disparities that have occurred in the past, uh, indigenous populations that have been disadvantaged, uh, minorities, uh, racial and ethnic minorities that have been disadvantaged. And so we, we're now, find our, we find ourselves with the current administration in the United States, for example, trying to understand how do we change the way we're engaging more broadly across these uh, uh, formerly disadvantaged groups uh, and at the same time address uh, uh, the challenges of climate change. So it, perhaps a lot more that, that we can cover it in a couple of minutes of, of answers. But I was impressed, Dr. Ortiz Garcia, for example, the, the engagement that you've used in practice in developing some of your plans, the uh, participatory approach, uh, is that one way that uh, uh, perhaps we can begin to address some of these uh, past inequities? Thank you for, for addressing that to me. I, th I think so. I think that uh, we are, are needing to talk and to communicate science, but also we are needing to hear, to, to listen, to, to uh, in, get involved in the um, knowledge that is there, uh, and it's been there for generations, and find ways to, to put those together. It, and I think that doing some of the things that we are working with uh, is illustrating how when you um, work with um, in a collaborative way for a objective that is quite clear. In, it, it could be for protecting pollinators or it could be for how can I best uh, use knowledge to, to make decisions about how to, when to plant, what to plant. I think that when we do this collaboratively, um, there's this um, corresponsibility and it, it is uh, better you get gain trust and um, definitely all the, um, all the actors must be there. And it's very challenging in Mexico, let me comment this, because not just because there's this um, um, fact that people has been left behind, but also because uh, we have even language barriers. The, the many indigenous people don't speak uh, Spanish. And so we have to come up with really uh, good ways or, or idea and translators and ways to, to engage. Uh, and it's not easy, but it's totally worth it to try. And I hope I sort of answer some of your um, issues. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Unfortunately, uh, we've come up against the end of our time for the webinar. And my final introduction of the day will be Dr. Tom Kuhn, who you just heard from. Uh, Tom is the uh, works at Oklahoma State University as Vice President, Dean and Director of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources. Uh, uh, Tom has a very distinguished career in extension uh, as a wildlife and fishery specialist at uh, University of Missouri and Michigan State University. Uh, Tom is currently the chair on our Board of Ag Assembly and our Policy Board of Directors. So uh, he is providing a major leadership role to us within uh, APLU, uh, Food, Agricultural, and Natural Resources. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Cohn for some closing comments as we end the webinar. Thank you, Dr. Steele, and, and thank you to our, our panelists and our, and our speakers, all uh, very uh, provocative uh, thoughts and and, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to share some of those slides out with uh, with others uh, because I, I think I couldn't keep up on, on my note taking. So uh, thank you for, for challenging us in that way. Um, I guess I would just close by, by saying, uh, you know, I think we really do have uh, uh, an opportunity and, and perhaps by nature of having this really be a, an effort to coordinate across the continent uh, from Canada through the United States uh, into Mexico, it really emphasizes the importance of collaboration, that we need these opportunities such as the uh, North American Agricultural Advisory Network that Dr. Wojtyki described. We need to be working close, more closely together and sharing content and sharing best practices and getting information out to, to producers, whether they're large scale uh, or perhaps uh, small scale, uh, uh, smallholder uh, farming and uh, ranching operations. So I think there's a lot for us to gain by working across those boundaries. I also think it's important for us to always challenge ourselves to think in an integrative approach. That is, uh, let's look at the full system. It, it, certainly environmental sciences are part of this and the way we interact with the environment, but, but producers, uh, farmers and ranchers and, uh, and, and, and processors and consumers, we really need to look at the entire supply chain in, in finding solutions because sometimes, and, and certainly activist groups have, have taken this approach, sometimes the way you change production practices is at the consumer end. Um, and sometimes the way you change consumer behavior is in the processing uh, segment of, of the supply chain. So I think it, it's very easy, and, and uh, my background in fisheries is I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to get in the water and try to understand scientifically what's going on there. But if that's all I do as a fishery scientist, or if that's all an agronomist does is, is to focus on, on the crop itself, uh, then, then we really have missed the opportunity to think about that in the context of that entire supply chain with the consumer in mind and the social and, uh, and environmental services that we're actually providing in, in the process of supplying our food systems. So um, those are all, all heady challenges, perhaps. I, I really appreciated Dr. Cairo at, at the end of yours that, that the recognition that the social scientists really need to be a, as key a part of this as the natural sciences are. And, uh, and I think our, our granting agencies, for example, are, are, are uh, uh, important partners in helping to uh, implement that. Uh, to make sure that there are opportunities for that kind of integrated research and social science research. So it's, uh, it's been 51 years. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I was a younger person um, back when uh, uh, Senator uh, Gaylord Nelson got us started on this, this uh, project of taking a day each year to step back and think about the world around us and the, the climate and the environment that we have inherited and to think very carefully about uh, the, the legacy that we are passing on to others. So uh, thank you all for participating, uh, those who've uh, added questions and certainly to our speakers and panelists. Thank you.